start to the day two of the conference with a fascinating and a fabulous speaker himself. Now talking about Penda, Penda is a fresh and motivated team of international creatives based in Austria and China. Now in the year 2013, Chris Precht and Dion Sun founded Penda with the belief that architecture can serve as a bridge which connects nature, culture as well as people to strive for a better quality of living. Now by drawing different perspectives from Western as well as Eastern architectural history, Penda seeks the fundamentals in architecture and also tries to interpret and integrate them into one cross-cultural design language. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us this morning, we have none other than Christian Precht of Penda Architects. So let's have a huge, huge round of applause to welcome the very fabulous Christian Precht. My name is Chris. I am an architect from Austria and I'm four years old. We founded our office back in 2014, so four years ago, um, and that's why I call my lecture architectural toddler. Because as a four-year-old, we are slowly learning how to stand on our own feet. We are slowly learning how to develop our own language. Um, and as a four-year-old, we are still having this necessary naivety to work on projects because we are passionate about that. That we are not asking what is profitable, um, but we are asking what is possible. Um, and I talk uh, today a lot about those projects we are passionate about, those topics we are passionate about. I talk a little bit about architecture in general and how I see in what direction architecture could change into in the future uh, to be relevant again. And I know how this sounds. I have a, I have a six year old cousin. Um, who, uh, who uh, if he would come up to me and would say, Chris, I'm going to talk about how I see the world and uh, in what way the world should change, I would be very suspicious if he would have any interesting thing to say about this. But on the other hand, I would be okay, also so very okay. curious because um, I think sometimes as grown-ups, uh, we lose a certain perspective, we lose a certain... Um, positivity and also a necessary naivety when we look at the world. And I think sometimes to change the perspective and get a little bit of a different perspective on things uh, might open up our future. So this is how I really grew up uh, when I was a real toddler. Um, this was when I was around uh, seven or eight. Um, and this Ferrari uh, my dad built. My father was a, a very good carpenter. Um, I drove uh, faster than 100 kilometers per hour and accidentally killed two chickens with it. Um, and this is also a pretty good analogy uh, for architecture itself, that um, before architecture, before I started to study, I had a Ferrari and I had hair, and now I'm practicing architecture and there is no Ferrari anymore, and I don't have hair either. Um, I'm now... Uh, 34 years old, um, which is a little bit of a weird age for an architect because I'm about 20 years too young to be important um, and I'm about 10, uh, 10 years too old to do anything else. So being young and an architect, uh, being, being a young architect <coughs> is a bit of a discrepancy in itself um, because you get good as an architect in your 50s, in your 60s, in your 70s. So being young is a little bit weird in architecture. But on the other side, um, it's also very exciting to be a young architect in this time because we are living in a time of great change. We are living in an age of transformation. Uh, is it technological uh, uh, changes? Is it um, geopolitical changes or uh, climatic changes? And I think that needs some answers. And I do believe that architects, how we are trained as architects, has a very unique skill set um, to guide people through those things. Because we are trained to, do, to combine um, business on one hand and creativity on the other hand. We are trained to combine the past, the history, traditions, craftsmanship with future edge, uh, with cutting edge future technology. We are somewhat of uh, strategic dreamers who turn their, or try to turn their visions into reality. 
And I think in, in those changes that are about to come or are coming at the moment, I think this is exactly the skill set which is needed to guide people. Through. Um, this doesn't necessarily just limit to construction, that also goes to other, um, to other industries, but I think uh, the construction industry in itself needs a lot of change. Um, the way we are building our building at the moment is very insufficient. Um, it's one of the biggest polluters uh, of our planet, uh, the construction industry. So I think with our skill set we can start with the construction uh, industry to bring some change, especially when it starts with the architects itself. So to highlight a little bit those changes we are about, about to come, I want to talk a little bit about the life of a building. Um, I think that the life of a building can be divided into five phases. The first one uh, is the starting of a project. Um, this is a very beautiful thing, or a very beautiful thought, that all of the projects ever built, uh, and hopefully ever will get built, all started the same way. They started with a pen and an empty paper. So the opportunities, they were endless. And I think that it's very beautiful that something so rudimentary in times like this, where everything is so fast changing with technology, that something so rudimentary that, that a pen and a paper connects our generation to all the past generations of builders. The second uh, part where there's a lot of change coming and already happening uh, is the designing part of the building, uh, which mostly invol involves us architects. New tools are coming in. Um, and the good thing for young architects is that they are already growing up uh, with this thing in university. And that is a very big advantage than what you can have in the top market. Um, the third part is how to build a building. As well here, there's a lot of, uh, lot of change happening. And I think there needs to be a lot of change that has to happen um, in order to, to build more ecological, to build uh, more sustainable in the future. The good part is that with new technologies like rapid prototyping, um, new materials like cross-laminated timber, um, the revival of bamboo, for example, um, the designing of the, of the building, like what the architects do, and the construction of the building, they move much closer together. So architects become much more part of, as well, the construction uh, of the building. Um, the third uh, part of the lifespan of a building is how to use a building. I will mainly talk about this uh, today. So the man talk will mainly uh, carry around this topic. I think there needs to have, have a lot of change uh, that has to happen in the future. And the fifth part, what is highly um, undervalued and mostly not thought about, of how we are deconstructing our building. Because a building like ourselves we have, has a limited lifespan. Um, so if we already think of how we can take down a building without burying all the uh, valuable resources underneath, I think that would be a very good start. Um, so all these changes are happening to architecture, to, to the construction industry. Um, but I do think that 99 of all the buildings constructed, 99% of all the architecture is and works exactly the same. They are basically islands in the city without any connections or, um, or uh, they are basically isolated in the city without any connections. Um, they are cores with expensive real estate around. And I do understand why developers are building that way and I do also understand why architects are uh, designing that way. Um, because it is a system and the system that, that makes money. Um, and it is very valuable. Um, so why changing something when it makes a lot of money? Um, I think one reason is that what the construction industry is also doing to our environment. Um, the construction industry is using more than 50% of the, of the planet's energy. It's, using more than four, uh, it's producing more than 40% uh, percent of the world's CO2. Um, so the construction industry, including us architects, are actually the biggest polluters of our planet. And we architects, we are very well part of this problem. And I think we are all conscious persons. As architects, we know what climate change will do to our environment. We also know the harm, uh, the, the harm what, what pollution can do to our, uh, to, to our health. I lived five years in Beijing, so I know uh, what it did to, to my health. Um, 
and we, pro we don't wake up in the morning and say um, to our mirror, um, how can I make the world today a bit, little bit worse? Um, I think we should be part of a solution of how to fix uh, our construction industry that it will be more sufficient and more ecological and more responsible uh, in the future. Because this cannot be the idea of how we bring back nature uh, into our city. This was an image uh, we took in, in Beijing one day. Um, I was born on the 1st of October, which gives me a pretty bad ranking, so 1 out of 10. Um, but and I don't believe in horoscopes. I don't believe uh, in necessarily zodiac signs. But I am a Libra, and I believe in one thing for myself, that I need to create balance in my life. Um, that, is, that is something I discovered throughout the last four years, that I need balance a, in the work we are doing, so um, within our projects, we are very well balanced. We are always working on two projects at the same time. We are working on one project for a client uh, and one project we self-initiate. The project for a client deals, of course, with compromises. It deals with restrictions. It is a dialogue back and forth, and you need to cut down on some ideas you are having. Um, on the other hand, you have self-initiated projects you really do because you believe in them. You believe in them that they might be very important in the future. So this creates a lot of um, passion within our team because on one side they can work for on a client's project, on a real project, and, and on the other hand they can work on a vision which might become then later on um, a real project. I will talk uh, in my talk today about both of those kind of projects. Um, I also, balance is also very important, or I discovered that balance is very important for me in my general life, to have a work-life balance. Um, and uh, because um, we are th I think we are all aware that architecture, or being an architect, is not the most healthy job in the world. Um, I actually believe that architects, they wear black, not because of a minimalistic fashion statement, uh, but they, they were black because of an emotional statement. I think we are all very, very sad inside. Because if you work 15 hours a day and you are constantly undervalued, uh, I mean, you necessarily, in a way, get very depressed. But today I feel a bit optimistic, so that's why I'm wearing a white shirt uh, underneath. But <clears throat> this balance we started uh, two years ago. We moved away from Beijing with our office. And we didn't move, we moved back to Austria. We didn't move to a big city like Vienna. Well, Vienna is also not that big, but at least it would be a city. Um, we also didn't move to, to a village. Uh, we really moved to the mountains. We don't have any neighbors uh, except a couple of cows. Um, and we work and we live from here. So that cut, cut out a lot of uh, unnecessary stuff I had to deal with in the city and really opened the mind for uh, uh, for crea creativity. It also opened the mind for creating some balance. So when the weather is good in, the, uh, in, in, in our environment, then we basically do this. We are on the mountains, we go skiing in winter, uh, we go hiking in summer. Um, and if I would actually do a lecture about just this topic, it would be much more interesting than about architecture. Um, but when the weather is not so good, um, we finally have some time to also do some projects. Uh, and this is what, what we are talking uh, today. Um, I gave you now a little bit of an insight uh, of me personally because um, I think it's always uh, important uh, to, to know a mindset behind projects. To not just see the outcome, but also be involved a little bit in the process. What, where does, uh, does a certain methodology come from, for example? Um, pr architecture is personal. So everybody of us has their own personal life stories, and this one also determines um, what kind of architecture you're producing. So for me and, and, and my team, it's mainly uh, those attributes. So we want to build something natural. We want to uh, develop architecture as maybe in a modular mindset, which is very easy to construct, um, responsive, uh, flexible, because we are a generation which is very flexible uh, itself. Um, so we want to create some architecture that somehow responds to, to a personal uh, life story in a way. Um, I'm going to start uh, with the first topic. I go now through a, a couple of those attributes and show a, a couple of projects to them. 
Um, the first topic is natural. Nature, um, I, as you saw, I grew up in the countryside of Austria, so nature was always a, always a very big influence uh, for me personally. When I first moved to China, um, we came to the south where my wife is, uh, is from. My wife is uh, from the south side of China. And this is her grandfather. He's a bamboo craftsman. He's weaving uh, baskets and so. So I was introduced to the material uh, bamboo very early on uh, in, my, in my time in China. Um, and I was really mesmerized by the, uh, by the capabilities of what bamboo has. Um, for example, bamboo can grow up to 1.4 meters per day. Um, it, can be, it is ready for construction within three years compared to a tree, for example, which needs uh, up to 100 years. Um, it can regrow out of the same root again, so, and it has structural capabilities that are comparable uh, to steel and concrete. So it's an amazing uh, architectural material, building material, but it's just not so, so often used because it is imperfect, and it's just not a perfect material. Um, and at times like this, where everybody is striving for perfection, um, something imperfect doesn't really fit the criteria, but it actually should. Um, we, with this project I'm going to introduce, it's called One with the Birds. Um, this was a self-initiated project. We didn't have any client on this project, for example. It was inspired by tippies uh, of Native Americans. Uh, and I really like this sort of typology of architecture because all the joints, they are tight. That means that uh, they don't make any harm on the, on the architectural structure, nor on the site they are building it. So they can take it away. Architecture becomes flexible whenever their herd of buffaloes uh, travel to some, somewhere else. Uh, and this one is, sorry. And this one is, is our interpretation then of this tippy. So it's a fully flexible uh, structure. It, can be, it is fully modular, so it can be expanded in each direction um, and also in height. And you then can build different products uh, from it. This is my father. Uh, he was not just a good craftsman, um, but he was also a crazy climber. My dad, he was famous for, to, for climbing all his routes without any security. So without any ropes, without any second net, just him in the mountain. So um, it's, uh, <coughs> it's easy to say that my father, he was connected to our natural environment in a very three-dimensional way. I think we had the same thing when we were kids. Um, we climbed trees. Uh, we, were, uh, we were somehow one with the wildlife, with the top of the, of the treetops. Uh, we were one with the birds. This one is also then the title of this project. I think when we grow older, though, we are more in a two-dimensional way in our natural surrounding, without any, um, without any visibility or any uh, guidance through the forest. And I think that's a pity. So this project aims to bring people again back to the treetops, back to the wildlife uh, of the trees. Um, I said before that this project is all self-initiated, so um, it, we developed for a, around two years um, a structure which is fully modular, which can be tied together with ropes um, in order to, to be stable. Um, we then uh, built a little bamboo uh, pavilion for the Beijing Design Week. Uh, we bought by ourselves a thousand bamboo canes, and our, all the people you see there, those, this is our team, who self-built the project in order to learn more about how bamboo works, what are the structural capabilities of bamboo, how we can use this, or how can we modify the structure itself. <coughs> so you see all the, all the joints are tight. Uh, there is no steel or no, um, or no metal uh, in this whole pavilion. And out of, the, out of this resource we got, or what we learned from this experience, um, we built some product designs. I call this really product designs because I don't want it to be architecture. Um, I hate actually the business of architecture. Um, the business we are in is, is not a good business because architecture is not scalable. So for example, if, you, um, if you're building a single family house, you have a team of maybe one or two uh, who are working on this family house. Um, but if you get an airport as a team, you hire 100 more people, but the margin doesn't change. 
Whereas if you think about product designs, if I um, design, for example, this beautiful chair down there and it sells a million times, this is a scalable business. So whenever we design something modular, I also try to combine it with a kind of a business strategy um, of, of product designing. So this one would be a very small shed, for example, for emergencies, for floods, for tsunamis, uh, where people can use then uh, local materials like bamboo and can, can build up easily sheds. Um, this one is a little, uh, little yoga studio with the same knot again. Um, this one is a little uh, hotel with five bedrooms and a community, a community center. And all of these ones, they are built up with the same technique. So all the joints uh, in this whole building are all the same. So if you, if you build one joint, all the builders know how to build the next 30. So it's a very repetitive and modular system which can uh, adapt to any needs and demands. So for example, if somebody builds a hotel and they need more rooms, they can easily uh, add, add to that or add to the height. Um, <clears throat> our first, uh, so we published this then, the whole package, because it was all self-initiated um, and we put some money into it. Um, we didn't know if ever we get a client from it, so we published all of it and uh, a lot of people then responded back. Um, and I found that there is really a market for temporary structures. Um, I didn't believe that first, but uh, people are really sitting on lands at the moment. Uh, they don't necessarily want to sell it because maybe the, the land prices are still rising. Um, so they, they want to build something for five or ten years and then take a look uh, what happens to the land. Maybe they sell it and they can easily take it down because it doesn't have a lot of impact uh, then for the site itself. Um, so this one is a project in a hotel, a surf hotel in Ecuador, um, in Ayampe, where they built with local uh, bamboo materials in a community-based based system. Uh, we sent two architects from, from our team there. They spent then two months uh, in, in Ecuador to build with the community this hotel. Um, here you see the structure a little bit further. Um, there's one structure now finished, a couple of new ones uh, are, are coming next to it and so forth. So it's very easy then uh, extendable uh, in any way. And then you see the sleeping pots which are basically plugged into the structure uh, once the structure is done. Um, and uh, a new project in, in Anxi County in the south of China uh, which also deals with the same the same way of building, the same uh, way of modular system, but in a more uh, ecological way, that we are planting a bamboo grove. As I said earlier, bamboo can grow very, very fast. And whenever you take out one cane of bamboo, you need to plant two more trees uh, to, the for to, to the grove. So therefore, the forest grows around the development and the development itself grows as well. And you're taking always local materials out in order to extend uh, your development. Um, I don't necessarily want to say that in the future we all, in, in order to accommodate 10 billion people, um, uh, we need to all live in bamboo sheds. Um, but I think it is also our responsibility as um, architects that we think about more sustainable and more ecological ways, uh, of uh, ecological alternatives, how we might be able uh, to create uh, a healthier future um, for all of us. The second topic I, I want to talk is modular. Um, modular designs uh, are very important for us. The first project you also saw, it was a very modular design um, because it is very easy to, to extend. I'm not talking about modular in the way that uh, Russian communist architecture was in the 60s, but uh, uh, modular designs or systems that leave space uh, for some variety to happen. I said before that Chin Chinese architecture is rooted in bamboo. So in the south of China, there's a big history of bamboo buildings. Austrian architecture, on the other hand, uh, is rooted in wood. Uh, it is no coincidence, for example, that this new material uh, who everybody is talking at the moment, cross-laminated timber, um, was invented in Austria. It was invented in Austria 30 years ago um, and uh, we basically built for 30 years just single-family homes. Until now, architects develop it that, oh, you can build higher than this. You actually can build sky, uh, skyscrapers out of wood because 
all the, the panels are cross laminated. That means the wood doesn't shrink or expand anymore. Uh, and this is the main problem with usually with wood buildings. So you can now in, in, um, in, in Japan, they are building a 40 story building just out of wood. You can build the cores out of wood, the emergency staircases, all out of wood. Um, and it has benefits when you're building in wood. Uh, some are uh, economical, some are ecological. For example, wood uh, is four times, a wood structure is four times lighter than a comparable concrete structure. That means you can build thinner and it is better resistant against earthquakes, for example. You get more square foot uh, for your building, 10% actually more square meters. Um, and uh, it also has health benefits. Uh, wood stores in one cubic meter wood, you store one ton of CO2. Um, and that actually makes it, makes it a great building, uh, uh, a great material to build. Wood also, people who live in wood buildings have a measurable lower heart rate. So it is actually a, a pretty uh, good material uh, or a pretty good alternative to go uh, forward in, in our construction uh, industry. The project itself was in, uh, the project I'm going to introduce is called Toronto Tree Tower, a building in Canada. Um, and it was inspired by Moshe Safdie's uh, Montreal uh, building, the Habitat 67. Um, I really love how this modularity of the, of the structure came into place, that he created voxels, so really three-dimensional objects, which were craned then into place, um, and the Bosco Verticale uh, in Milan. Um, so both of them were inspired this project, the Toronto Tree Tower. So we as well, we um, try to prefabricate all the units uh, in a shipyard off-site and then deliver it during the night and all those units then get installed and craned into place. Um, here you see then how the Toronto Tree Tower looks in its, uh, in its setting. Um, and the building material itself, so every balcony gets a tree, um, and the building material itself uh, grows basically on the tower. And you have then your personal garden, uh, your personal home with a garden, but with a great view. Um, <coughs> when it comes to wood buildings, I really like this, this diagram. Um, wood uh, gets grown by a natural resource, by, this, by our sun. Uh, it gives oxygen to all of us. And then it gets uh, fabricated into, for example, the panels or into timber um, used for construction, used for a building. And after the lifestyle of a lifespan of a building, uh, the building can be taken down and the, root, the wood can be reused and has a second life, basically. Um, a third topic of our work is, deals with culture. Um, I will go through a couple of projects pretty quickly. Um, of cultural projects, um, Victor Hugo said uh, that architecture used to be the main dominating art form. Um, generations were communicating with each other through architecture. It was really important to define an identity of a culture and of peoples. Um, I think this diminished uh, very rapidly since industrialization, since, since the printing machine uh, came and literature took over as the main dominating art form and through modernism. Um, now I think a lot of people, they, it doesn't matter if you are in, in Delhi, if you are in London, if you are in Beijing, the identity of buildings is missing. Um, everything looks kind of the same at the moment, but it used to be uh, very, very different. Um, for us, as, a, as an office, this is also an important point, the cultural differences between Asian architecture, which is rooted in a whole different way, um, than uh, European architecture. I don't go too much in there, but one of the most interesting uh, parts uh, of our work is always this cross-cultural uh, dialogue of what inspired, uh, for example, um, a Chinese building, or how can we combine both uh, methodologies into one language uh, for design. Our first buildings, or our first apartments, uh, were caves. So we all, our ancestry is coming from caves. Um, it was not just our own apartments, but also our first galleries, our first museums, our first artworks. 
Um, so the cave uh, has a big tradition also in a, in a cultural sense. For this project on the left, um, we were inspired by the scent of a cave because the arc as a, as a building typology or, or as a structural typology is a direct interpretation of the cave. Um, and we use then this arc for an entrance of a gallery. Uh, so again, uh, a gallery as our caves were the first galleries. Um, and we combined arches uh, with, uh, with counter arches. And they then uh, make uh, a, an entrance ribbon into the, into the gallery with guides people uh, in a very natural way into the space and attracts them. Um, this project uh, is in Beijing. Um, since the first sketch we did uh, until the opening, uh, it took 31 days. So there were a lot of people working there. So something like this would be not possible in, in Austria, for example. It would probably take a year in Austria to build this little gallery. Um, next to it is another space uh, for the same client. Um, so one is the gallery. The other one is a kind of an art auditorium where people then after um, after an exhibition, hold lectures, hold readings, for example. Uh, so the client said he would like people sit there and be inspired by what they hear and maybe also be inspired by the space. So we took again this language of arches and this time we took it to infinity. So we used uh, arches and counter arches again, combined them with mirror and, some, and, and maybe somebody sits there and losing himself, uh, well, great place for a selfie, but also, if, if, you, if one thinks uh, about himself and maybe he loses himself in, in, in infinity, and maybe this is also the place where ideas or creativity then uh, comes from. Another little project, a hotel, a 200 room hotel in Beijing, um, a low budget hotel. And uh, we also had to be low budget uh, with the materials we used. So it is next to the Hutong area, and we used the old bricks of the Hutong area to construct the facade and cut it in an opening of a typical uh, Chinese um, uh, hutong house. Also inside it's, play, it's playing with volume so people are somehow going through like they would go through a traditional hutong area um, but they are all inside. This is myself uh, in, the, in the back side. You also see that again it was before architecture because I still had hair. And the wall you're seeing is a double wall. So there is still a space between. Uh, my father also with his carpentry uh, skills, he built my whole room. And in this wall back there, there is another slide. He built in some hidden drawers, some secret compartments. Some of them I found years later. So I grew up in a space uh, when I was a kid, which always had a lot of uh, curiosity. Uh, on me to, to find out what else my father hid there um, and what else is secret into this space. So it put a lot of curiosity when I was growing up. And I think this also somehow inspired us for this project. It's, a, it's called Snow Apartment. It's not an apartment, it's actually a vacation home. So the client goes there with his friends. It has seven bedrooms for a ski trip. Um, it's next to a skiing area. And they go there for a weekend or so, and they sleep all in there. And we wanted to create a full um, winter experience for them. Um, so that they are going skiing during the day, and then come back uh, to a space which is still inspired by an igloo, in a way, what you're building out of, out of uh, snow. But it still has a, a lot of warmth in it, so it feels cozy. For example, there are heating pipes in the wall. So when you touch them, they are very haptic and warm. Um, <coughs> yeah, and then it just, uh, the shape is then cut with uh, contrast material of wood uh, to, to, uh, to give a little bit warmth also in the material. All right. um, <coughs> this project was, uh, is, a, is a bridge for the Olympic Games in Beijing. The, uh, Beijing won the, the Olympic Games bid for the Winter Olympics in 2022. Um, and this bridge is also somehow inspired by the, by, the, um, by the culture of Olympic Games. So not just the logo as a design strategy, but also a, a certain attributes like openness, uh, inclusion, um, inviting, 
uh, bringing the world together and so forth. So all of this one uh, should, be, should be carried by the design uh, for this bridge. We worked uh, with Arup, uh, with, one, uh, with structural engineers, one of the best ones when it comes to bridge design, um, to define those Olympic rings into a structure for this bridge. So from the side, it looks like three mountains, and that's the name of the bridge, San Chan, which means three mountain bridge. Um, from the top, it looks like a DNA string, because it also connects a little bit to sport, to um, hopefully not to doping, but... Uh, <coughs> and from the, when you circle around the bridge, it opens up, it becomes a circle. And the circle in Chinese history, in Chinese vernacular architecture, it, it has always a meaning of inviting people uh, into something. You probably know Chinese gardens, for example. They have as an entrance door, uh, they have a big circle. Um, <clears throat> the next cultural project is a, a tower in Tel Aviv. Um, Tel Aviv uh, is, uh, is identified with two kind of buildings. So first, uh, the Mediterranean style buildings, beautiful thick stone walls with arches as cutouts, and on the other side, Bauhaus buildings. So Tel Aviv has the best preserved houses from the Bauhaus era. And we tried to respond with our design to both of them in a way. Um, so it has those, uh, those attributes of a Bauhaus, um, but also the materiality, the haptic material um, that responds back to a certain Mediterranean uh, architecture, which is always based on climatic changes, uh, so climatic influences. Uh, Tel Aviv is very hot, so it has a large balcony which, which acts as a kind of a buffer zone uh, between uh, the balconies itself and uh, the apartments uh, inside. Um, <clears throat> we also got now some, uh, or it starts that we get some projects from India, still uh, very few, but uh, there are uh, a few. And I was always very inspired by uh, stairwells, Indian stairwells. I think these are the, one of the most beautiful uh, structures uh, worldwide. And we combined for a landscape design those uh, stairwells, or the, the, the notion of stairwells with water mazes. Um, and uh, doing this, uh, this landscape uh, for Hyderabad uh, uh, at the moment. It's a public uh, square in Hyderabad, um, which has very fast lanes where people can go through with a bike. Then they have strolling lanes where people can slower go through uh, when they go with a dog or some hidden parts where maybe lovers can go. A second project uh, as well for Hyderabad for the same client, uh, which is called Pucha Crafted Home, uh, located in Hyderabad. Um, a hotel, it's a very new project of ours. Um, I, was, I was also always inspired by patterns, Indian patterns, henna tattoo. And I'm not sure if this is true, but at least it's my notion of, uh, of, of Indian culture that uh, in, I, I, I don't know any other culture which has so many creative industries based on, on, uh, on the same principles. So every, when I look at, at fashion, when I look at henna tattoos, when I look at buildings, I always see patterns. Uh, and this is something very, very beautiful, I think, that all those creative industries are so interwoven with, with each other. And, and that speaks also for, for a very strong, uh, strong cultural identity in the way. Um, this is, my, uh, this is a sketch I, I did for the project. It's not the best sketch I ever did. Um, but uh, it so should create this pattern on one, on one side, um, but then combine it with architectural typologies like balconies, for example. Um, so here you see how the pattern itself builds up, mainly triangular shapes that turn then into the facade of the building. All the triangles they are covered uh, with, uh, with green roofs and they give on the facade for the hotel a little bit of a privacy. So when you are coming into the hotel and you go outside to a balcony, you still have privacy, you somehow still have a little bit this resort feeling. Here's a little build up of the hotel. 
Um, I was, we, we had to revise two times the design because two times there were two less parking spaces. I have never thought that I would include so many parking spaces in the design. Um, then in the, in the center there are all the public uh, areas like banquet halls, uh, uh, conference halls, the lobby, uh, restaurants, etc. And on the two uh, side uh, courts there are the, all the rooms. Here you see a little bit uh, um, how, the, how our notion is that the, um, that, the, that the green of the landscape somehow continues over uh, to the building itself. So when you look at it from the front, uh, it opens completely up. Uh, people can look outside, people can look inside, but when you pass the street from the side, um, it closes all the time, all, always a little bit more uh, and gives a little bit more privacy. So when you see it from the side, you basically just see a green roof. And these are the balconies that com should combine then uh, this, this, this sense of pattern, uh, the, the sense of culture with balconies. Um, also, uh, a third project in Hyderabad uh, is a uh, uh, villas. I usually like to design villas. Uh, but the client came uh, to us and asked for 50 villas uh, and all of them next to each other. I know that kind of um, urban, uh, urban development from Chinese cities. Uh, they are called villas, but actually it's not really a villa um, because the privacy is, is not, not a lot. And uh, there's also no I identification of the houses itself because you basically have 50 villas which all look the same. So we tried to, to break this a little bit to, um, and uh, are inspired by those boulders you see before and to create not a, a normal horizontal villa but to create for each villa um, four vertical cores which are all based in Vastu. I think Hadrabat is famous for that, that you have to deal with Vastu which was a very hard thing to actually get into. Um, and uh, create then in between those villas, when you mix it up with nature, it create, creates variety. So not, uh, not all of the, of the houses look the same. So there is a little bit of uh, identity you might, you might then find uh, uh, your house, for example, into it. And a bit of a, uh, the repetitiveness uh, of a normal villa area gets broken by, uh, by this. Uh, one other attribute uh, for us which became very important, especially with, uh, with social media uh, these days, is being responsive uh, as a design. Um, I showed before uh, the, the design for the, uh, for the bamboo, um, and I said that it was a very hands-on approach. And I was not used to that, because I'm coming, uh, my generation is basically dealing with computers all the time. I used to work with a lot of computers uh, in my studies, and I continue to do so as well now. But there are also projects where it's not, where, where hands-on approach is much better. For this project, for example, we worked with Coca-Cola together to create in China awareness for, uh, for plastic waste. So we collect, students could bring 10 cola bottles, empty ones, and they got one filled one. Um, so we collected 17,000 cola bottles and they asked us to make a design out of that. So we designed a kind of a cola swoosh uh, with it, which was basically, if you build a model, it would be a paper stripe. So I tried to do a paper stripe in the computer and I failed miserably. Um, I worked on it, I, I guess, four days and I just couldn't solve it. There are now probably some tools how you can do it, but it, is, it was very difficult for me back then. Uh, so my wife came to me then and said, well, why not just do a model uh, of a paper stripe? <laughs> and we did that in yeah, maybe 10 minutes. Not the nicest model, but it was enough for the builders then to build this one in another day um, and install the color bottles in the next day. So it did that took them longer, uh, shorter to build the whole pavilion uh, than me failing with uh, designing a paper stripe. So sometimes it's it's even if you have the computer, um, and the computer do, can do everything, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything with the computer. This project, though, it helped a lot that we had a computer. Um, this was our first project. Um, 
I, I sometimes get some questions of how we got our first project because I think that's always the most crucial part of how can you actually start. It's a bit of a catch-22 because clients don't come to you because you don't have any experience, but how should you gain experience if you don't have any clients? Um, so it's a little bit a, a snake which is biting in its own tail. Um, we got this project um, through a pretty good business strategy. Um, we lied. We lied about our experience, we lied about our team, um, we, we made ourselves a little bit better than we were actually. Um, it was basically just two of us uh, who, who were working in our office. Um, but we had then a conference, like a, a kind of a Skype call, but we just showed our screen. And uh, we were introducing then the project on our screen. In the background, we had YouTube with office sound typed in. So there was always some office sound in the background. So this made us look very uh, a commercial office. Uh, and we, we won the competition then. Uh, this project is for a public plaza in the, in, the, in the center of China. If you ever have been in China, um, you know this image when you're going uh, to the um, to, to a shopping mall in the evening, people are dancing everywhere. Um, so this is still this communal feeling that, uh, that is still existing in China. Um, and for that we wanted to create a kind of a responsive architecture that, that the design of our, of our um, structure uh, adapts to whatever is happening on the plaza itself. Um, so we called it sound wave. So to, it is between the city and uh, a, a local park, a myrtle flower uh, garden. Um, it has the, the, the colors, of the pink colors of the myrtle trees, um, and, uh, and somehow combines as a kind of a sound wave, uh, guides the people into it, and is a transition space then towards the park. Um, here I said that it was very important to have the, those those computer tools because there are 700 different fins uh, between 2 meters and 12 meter height. All of them are different in height, all of them have a different profile, a different amount of steel, a different paneling. Um, so we needed to, paint, to draw 700 different sections, 700 different plans and 700 different elevations. And but with tools these days, uh, you basically can do that in, in an afternoon. Um, so it also helps sometimes uh, to, to, uh, to be equipped with skills on the computer. But you necessarily should do both all the time. Um, all the fins, they are perforated towards the top. They have LED lighting uh, in the top. And whatever is happening on the, on the plaza, so if a lot of people uh, um, are dancing, for example, or moving around, sensors are capturing that. And that translates then into the lighting of the plaza. So the more movement is going on, um, the more uh, lighting would then be uh, on this plaza. So for example, in our space now, there would be not so much light because I'm the only one uh, who is basically moving. Um, <coughs> flexibility is also a big uh, part of our methodology of how we design. Um, we are young gen generation as architects. Uh, as I said, we are toddlers, and I think our generation is much more flexible than our parents' generation were, for example. And the generation which is coming after us is much more flexible than we are. Um, so I think there is a constant increase of flexibility of generations. So for example, I was able um, to move to Beijing to open up an architectural studio. That would not have been possible for my dad not only because he was just climbing around, but, uh, but also in his generation. That would be, have been a very different, different thing to do. Um, so I think, and, and as our generation, the flexibility is growing, I think architecture is still very static. It is still very still. Um, uh, I think our industry is still somehow a little bit sleeping. But I think that Architecture doesn't have necessarily to be frozen music. Um, I think it can move and can adapt uh, to whatever is the demand or the need on a space. So for example, we did this project for, for an office uh, uh, for, for Volkswagen in Beijing, for their headquarter. Um, in their headquarter, this is a think tank. 
and they want to use their think tank not just as a place where they, where they meet, but also where they have media presentations, where they, where they can work, where they have different kind of meetings, so uh, smaller meeting rooms, larger meeting rooms, uh, and so forth. So this space then can adapt to all of the given needs and demands. It has uh, flexible rotating doors. Uh, they can close up in very small scale, uh, like four different meeting rooms, or they open up for media events uh, and, and, and other occasions. Another project uh, is a music hall in, uh, in Xi'an. Uh, Xi'an is a very old city in China, a very traditional city in China. It has a traditional old town uh, with, a, um, with, a, with, uh, with a river around it. So it has those bridges which are always coming down. So people can go then to the old, uh, to the old town. So we took this idea of those bridges and we tried to create a space which is as flexible as music itself, as, variety, as, as, as much variety as music itself. So when it's closed up, nothing is happening. When it folds up the facade, then people can enter and there is a happening then in the inside. And also in the inside, it's different rooms, different sizes of rooms. So for example, three rooms when everything is closed or you can combine them when everything is folding down. So really a flexible approach. Also this little house uh, for, for a countryside home, a product design we are working on at the moment. So you can close it up when you're not there, you rotate it up uh, when you're there and you create 50% uh, more uh, space, interior space uh, for your home. Um, we are also working with a, with a company called Bigger uh, they, are, they are doing flexible interior designs. We are all living in, uh, in times where uh, the, the real estate prices are rising dramatically. Um, so we all need to deal with having uh, smaller spaces and maybe there is, uh, there is an uh, opportunity that design can, can be an answer with that with flexible interior. And this flexibility we also try to bring to an urban le uh, level. As we, we create, for example, this museum which has two public platforms. They are on, on platforms that can rotate and they can uh, they, can, they can change to whatever is happening in its surroundings. So for example in winter it can close up the park next door because in winter a park is, is more like a, like a dead land. Um, for public painting classes it can be different. For cinemas in the evening it can stand different. For public viewing when Germany is losing against Austria in the World Cup in football um, it can be uh, staged different. Or for music festival it can become a background. So whatever is happening in the surrounding, flexible architecture can, can adapt and interact with people and with city life itself. And the last part I want to talk about, this is the, the topic which is closest to my heart, I, uh, is vitality, healthy buildings. Um, I showed you before where we moved now and where I'm coming from. Um, so this one always played a little bit of a role. Before it was more unconscious role in designing, but it always became more dominant uh, to create vital buildings. Um, this one is my wife, Faye. Uh, and uh, you see that we are basically growing all our food as much as possible by ourselves. Um, we, we have around 10 minutes or so to, to drive to the supermarket, so we try to be as self-sufficient with our food as somehow possible. Um, so we, we grow by ourselves, harvest by ourselves, we get the, the, the meat what we are eating from the farmers next door. Um, we got now chickens, so we have eggs, so we try to, uh, to, be, to be a little bit independent uh, from this whole machinery of supermarkets and food production. Um, we are involved uh, with our friend Niklas in a, in a, um, in a startup. Um, in a very small startup yet, but I think I see a lot of uh, potential in this that they grow vertical gardens out of ropes. Um, Niklas has a rope manufacturer uh, manufacturer at home and he basically uh, uh, weaves seeds into the ropes and after some time they just hang in a, in a basin of water and after some time you grow all kind of vegetables out of it. Uh, we even grew pumpkins and salads uh, out of those ropes. So here you see some, uh, some of those ropes, how they then translate. So this is not just of how you can grow your own food, but also maybe a strategy of how you naturally can cool down 
buildings in a hot environment, for example. So I see a lot of potential there. Um, that is a very old, traditional Austrian farm. I like about it uh, that it has everything under one roof. So on one hand, uh, you have working agriculture, uh, then you have your machinery under one roof, and the living part under one roof. We took this strategy of this typology to build this little house uh, in, in Germany, um, which has a very small plot, so there is not a lot of possibility to grow your own vegetables. So we gave the space then back to, to the people on the roof that they can grow uh, their own food and their own garden. Um, this project is called Yin and Yang House, so it combines working and living uh, underneath uh, one room, uh, one roof uh, in a way. Here you can see the build-up, it's again uh, constructed uh, with CLT panels, um, so it is a wood house and uh, the plants then on top. The interior. <coughs> and here you see uh, in the summer, uh, summertime, uh, how people will, uh, will grow their vegetables. And in the wintertime, maybe the German can use it as a skiing slopes to train for skiing. Um, so food and architecture are two topics which, uh, which are very important for us. And I think those are also two industries, agriculture and the building industry, which are highly insufficient by themselves. Um, so, for example, agriculture um, uh, use is, is insufficient. It uses, for example, 70% of all of our drinking water. Um, it's a big threat how we grow our vegetables at the moment for biodiversity. Um, so I think uh, agriculture itself needs to change because if we are 10 billion people by 2050, um, we need to think about strategies of how we feed our population. Um, food security is one of the biggest topics of city at the moment. So with this project, sorry, with this project, uh, we try to combine both of it. Um, this one is a generic building. Um, I think when a client is coming to us and, and say, uh, design this high rise for us, we would be pretty happy to get it. Uh, if he lets us do something like this, uh, we are even more happier. Um, if we can integrate fully green into our design, uh, we probably would hug him. But this is where it really uh, becomes interesting, when uh, nature, food, uh, and the building itself merge into one design. So both give space towards the other one. And people cannot just live there, but also uh, be uh, self-sufficient with their own food they are growing for themselves. So uh, a building is not just there then for people, but also there for nature and to feed people. And in this sense, then, the building might give, is not just an island in the city, but might also give something back to a wider community uh, when you give out, for example, vegetables uh, which are growing on your building. The whole thing started with a project we did uh, for the refugee crisis. So we tried to come up with a system that, is, that was very easy to assemble, very fast to market. Um, and we designed them uh, with uh, cross-laminated timber panels again. So inside the triangles, you have uh, your living spaces. And outside of the triangles, you have your space for growing your own gardens. Again, a very modular design of uh, having a catalog of modules where you can choose out of. Uh, and based on your modules, then you can design how large your, uh, your uh, building needs to be. So for example, if uh, a refugee is coming to Austria, he would get a very fast uh, to assemble little building. Um, back then, they were, uh, refugees were not allowed to go into, our, into a workplace in Austria, so they, they were not allowed to get a work permit. But at least if they can grow their own food on their roof and maybe grow even a bit more than they need, they can sell it maybe to the population. It's the first interaction, the first, um, a first social interaction. Um, <clears throat> then, because it's modular, it can be extended again in every direction. So this one is, for example, if the family is coming afterwards then also to Austria and they need to extend uh, the building. A little bit of a different setup with, uh, with a greenhouse uh, where they can also grow vegetables in winter. 
and a bit of larger structures, uh, not just shelters for refugees, but maybe also uh, single-family homes uh, for people who really want to grow their own food uh, on its facade. And this gives basically space uh, to do both of them. So whenever you look outside of your bedroom, you're always fully uh, immersed uh, in your vegetable garden. And you can, you can grow everything by yourself. Uh, <coughs> where it become, here's, this one was a little townhouse. Um, here a little student dormitory, for example. And where it gets really interesting is when you bring this idea to the verticality of our cities. That uh, building, that the skyscrapers we are designing at the moment uh, is, not, uh, is not just isolated in our city fabric but something uh, can give something back and is, has, a, has a certain interaction with its surrounding. At the moment, I believe that all the interaction uh, between a building and the city stops at the doorman. Um, but maybe this one changes when you have then markets on the, on the bottom floor uh, to, that the connection passes by uh, the doorman. Food uh, is the new internet. Um, I fully agree with this, with this statement from Kimball Musk. Um, food is a five trillion dollar industry. Uh, the building uh, or the construction industry is an even bigger uh, 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 industry. So if you co could find ways how to merge them together, maybe both can benefit uh, from each other. Um, because at the moment how we grow our food as I said before, is very insufficient. So it, needs, it, it takes uh, away a lot of our drinking water. Uh, we basically just uh, plant crops in order to feed cows, in order to feed ourselves. Um, but I think uh, that there is much more, uh, much more possible. Um, sorry. And this whole food production um, uh, needs to change in future. Um, but not just the food production, but also the food supply chain. So if I think I go in an Austrian supermarket and I find uh, tomatoes that are from New Zealand and those tomatoes are cheaper than the tomatoes I can buy locally from Austria, I think there is also something going very wrong with our, su uh, with our food supply. Um, so what can we do? I think one very important part is to grow local and eat local. And if, if we cannot, if we don't have the space to do that, um, then we have to support farmers uh, who, who grows local. Um, and uh, in Austria, a big topic is also eat seasonal. So whatever is growing at the moment, um, you make your dishes from. Um, so I think this is a first step of how we, how we can uh, go against uh, this insufficient agriculture. Um, and governments basically agree with this notion. They support, uh, one of their biggest agendas is to have food security for the cities, for their own cities. They don't, they, they don't need to import so much food from somewhere else, but can live in, when there's a crisis, can feed their own citizens. Um, also the market agrees. If you, if you think that there are, uh, for example, food sections, organic food sections and real food sections in a supermarket, are getting bigger and bigger, where else the sell, selling of microwaves and frozen food is plummeting. Um, so there is also a big market uh, then for that. Um, and I think the second part that we need to do is to take back ownership of our food. Because at the moment, most of our food or yeah, most of our food belongs to maybe a handful of huge corporations like Monsanto, Nestle, Bayer, uh, most of them are uh, uh, chemical, uh, chemical industries. Um, so it's really weird that all of those industries actually own what we are eating. So I think taking back ownership uh, for our food is very important because real food and healthy food is not uh, a commodity or a luxury, but it is a human right. Uh, so I think we also need to start doing that. And it also makes sense to uh, grow food in our cities because the cities itself, they produce energy anyways. And energy means that uh, we produce a lot of heat, we produce a lot of warmth. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, vegetables, they need warmth in order to grow. 
like tomatoes, beans, nuts, uh, and so forth. So there are a lot of vegetables uh, that that will will grow very very well in cities if they if they find some gardens where they actually uh, can grow. And at the same time, because it is a green layer between the outside and the inside of the building, it's a little bit of a buffer zone that can cool down the building in a natural way and maybe it, it uses then less energy um, um, uh, when the building uh, is operating. So this would be, for example, the first floor, how it interacts with its surroundings so that the food that is produced on the upper floors gets then sold or given out to the community on the lower floors. So the, the, the building itself, uh, the connection does not stop uh, at, the, at the doorman. And maybe by connecting agriculture and architecture, we have a win-win-win situation for everybody. So for the city, maybe for the building itself, and for the community uh, as well. Um, I want to, to close up my talk today um, on a positive note, uh, especially for, for the, the other architectural toddlers uh, who are inside uh, here today. Um, when I was studying, uh, I, I knew this feeling that uh, architecture can be very, very overwhelming. Um, I, when, I got, when I was very small, like five or six years, my parents gave me a little book, and it was a zoom out book, and it started on the first page with three uh, with three states, with three triangular states. And then the next page zoomed out a little bit and you saw that this one was the comb of the root. And the next page it zoomed out a bit further and you saw two children looking at it. The next step was just a magazine um, where this one was the title of the page and the, piece, and the guy had dinner. So it zoomed out with each page and on the last page you basically were on the moon and you looked at um, and, and and you looked at the uh, sorry, and you looked at the at the earth from the moon, and I think that looking at architecture is somehow like this last page um, on the uh, in this book. So when we are studying, um, we we know that there is uh, this architecture that connects all of this history, all of those traditions, all this vernacular and culture, all comes together in our craft. And this can be very overwhelming uh, for people. But I truly believe that real change does not happen on this last page. Real change happens on those pages in between. And the beautiful thing about architecture nowadays is that those pages in between, they are very large. Uh, with new technologies coming in, you don't have to be necessarily an architect uh, to design buildings. You can design jewelry, for example. So there are a lot of space in those pages in between. And I think if uh, either one of us is making a little bit of a change in their own page, in their own niche, um, and uh, maybe innovate something in their own page, that then can create a big change then uh, for the architectural world, how you see it then on the last page. So um, this is really something, some thought that really gets me going as, a, as an architect. As a young architect, I really still enjoy being an architectural toddler and my architectural puberty can wait for a while. Thank you.